moment we're gonna pause just for a minute just to um, just enter into um, Remembrance Sunday here at the house. Um, I'd love to for us this morning just to frame um, this part of the service as just a continual worshipping of Jesus and that actually this is a time where the church as one gets to pray as one as we pray for the world because the world needs Jesus everything that we've just been declaring they're not nice words that you maybe read on a birthday card or a Christmas card, this is truth that will change the world and that the world is crying out for a saviour and it is, the, it, is our, it is our privilege to represent Jesus well that we are his body so I'm going to um, invite um, Wendy just to come over we're going to, I'm just going to read out to you Isaiah 9. We're going to just pause for a minute to remember those who have fallen. Um, and, then we, and then Wendy is going to come and bring a, just a prayer for us. And then we're going to pause again. Um, and then we're going to go back into worship. Is that okay, guys? Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. And he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. This is the passionate commitment of the Lord. Amen. Father, we just pause right now at 11 o'clock just to remember those who have gone before us. So this weekend we've been remembering 
the two world wars in which we as a nation have been involved. But I now want to pray about the two wars concerning us at this time. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We thank you that you are working your purposes out even in these times of war and much heartache in the nations around the world. For why do the nations rage? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? Only you, O oh Lord, see the plight of the people in Ukraine and Russia. Only you, O oh Lord, can bring an answer to those that desire peace and justice. Only you, O oh Lord, can comfort those that grieve and those that have lost their homes. Bring, we pray, an end to the battle, this battle of nation against nation. We pray for the Middle East, and you tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You reign forever, executing justice from your throne. You will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. You are the shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. You are their strength in times of trouble. Remember your covenant forever with Abraham and the oath you swore to Isaac. You confirm to Jacob as a decree and to the people of Israel as a never-ending covenant to give them the land of Canaan as their special possession. You have gathered them from the nations and places where you had banished them, and their destiny is assured. This battle is yours, O God. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones on both sides, and we pray for those who have been made homeless and some who have lost everything. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the wounded and ask you to protect those that have been kidnapped. Send your ministering angels to protect them and bring them home safely. You, O oh Lord, are the answer. You have broken down the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile, and salvation is your name. We pray that your plans and purposes will be fulfilled, and that a mighty revelation of who you are will be revealed to Jews and Arabs. Amen. Just as we um, just go back into song, I just want to encourage all of us this morning for you to, I, I talked last week about intercession, the privilege that we have, being able to go into the presence of the Lord, taking someone with you that maybe you might be carrying, maybe it's a relation, maybe it's a nation that we've just been praying, but this is in a moment that we are all gathered, to gay, gathered together under the name of Jesus, and we just have this moment now just to intercede on behalf of others. So we're going to go into a song, um, and this is our time, church, to lift up the nations. Amen.
Jesus, we just declare this again, that your name is Wonderful Counselor. You are Mighty God. You are Everlasting Father. You are Prince of Peace. Your government and its peace will never end end he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor david your government its peace will never end jesus jesus we just declare that it is you that this world is crying out for that no seeking justice outside of your name will ever satisfy will ever satisfy Jesus, it is you, and I thank you, Jesus, that you hold this world together. Where, where the, the father of lies will say it's hopeless, it's not, because Jesus, you are in charge. You are holding the world together. We thank you, Jesus, that you are in charge. Amen. If you'd like to uh, find yourself a seat, um, well, good morning, um, everybody. It's a privilege to be with you this morning in Life Church Bath. My name is Jonathan. Oh, I know you know, Paul. Um, I want to just um, make a special shout out just for those who have been involved this morning in production, worship, setting up and everything. For those who didn't know that we didn't have, um, yes, we didn't have any power in this building and even the street lights outside, traffic lights, we had no power till about 10 to 10 this morning. So um, they've virtually had no practice and being able to just put everything together. So I'd love just to give a shout out to Phil Mashida specifically. Yeah, he's he's hiding, um, but but just but I would just like to say just across the board, um, Life Church Bath, we just have amazing servants in this house that serve us. They do a phenomenal job. Um, I'm going to um, ask the um, hospitality team just to come and release the, the buckets. We're going to receive everybody's tithes and offerings. Um, what a day it is to be a cheerful giver. Do you know where there is so much fear of, the, of finances that is going on around nations? Um, you don't have to be an economist just to say that what, what everyone is predicting out of fear. I would love just to say that in this house of the Lord, we have the Jehovah Jireh on our side and that we are different. We are outside of the world. That if you trust the Lord with your finances, if you believe in who he is, he will honor his name. So I would love just to pray a blessing over you. Father, we thank you. And I just thank you and just bless every household in this uh, family with their finances, Lord, that we would not only just have what we need, but even more to give away and to be a generous people. Amen. Amen. Well, um, while the buckets are going round, I'm going to um, just ask for the um, announcements just to be played. We're going to have church news now before we uh, move on to the word. And the youth, uh, we're going to send the youth out now as well. So if you're youth, um, you're going to come down to this door down here and uh, Tim's going to take you down into your next meeting. So if we can play the church news, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Amy. And welcome to Live Church News. We have got the well happening tonight at 6.30pm at St. Swithin's Church. We'd love you to come along as we gather with other churches from across the city to worship together and pray together. It's going to be a great evening. That's tonight at 6.30 at St. Swithin's. Can I get an encore? Do you want more? Yes, you do. This Wednesday, 11 a.m. in the ballroom. Please feel free to stay afterwards to fellowship over a bring your own lunch. Next Sunday, we have got baptisms in our morning meeting there is still time to register if you'd like to be baptized next sunday please email me at amy.wire at lifechurchbath.com by this coming tuesday if you'd like to be baptized and we'd love to chat with you about it navigating finances god's way is a two-session course happening on monday the 20th and the 27th of november 
This will take you on a practical and spiritual journey into managing your finances in God's way and will be led by Mark Lloyd Bottom. For more information and to sign up, please head over to the website lifechurchbath.com. That's it from us. I hope you have a great week. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, um, before we um, hear from an announcement from Emma and Jonathan, who's going to bring the word, we're just going to break for a few minutes. Um, please stand up, say hi to someone that you don't know. Um, Live Church Bath, there's a lot of new people I can see. Make yourself known. So we're just going to break for a few minutes while we uh, transition into the next part of the service. Okay, let's wrap up these beautiful conversations. There's a lot of love going on in this building. It's just marvelous. Lovely, lovely. Okay, if you want to make your way back to your seats. Wonderful. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, welcome again, everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Jonathan Clark. I'm on the pastoral team here. This is Emma. She's wonderful. Um, Emma's got some news for us. This is like family news. How many of you love family news? How many of you are like, when you say family news, it gives me like a slight feeling like, uh, anyway, we're excited. We're, Emma, we're excited and sad all at the same time. So tell it to us. <laughs> Uh, so from February half term, I will no longer be the children's and families pastor of Life Church Bath. <laughs> um, I, some of you might know. Um, so since March this year, I've been 
doing emotion coaching in secondary schools. So I've been meeting with teenagers one-on-one -on -one and um, yeah, kind of helping them process whatever is going on in their life. Um, that's been my dream for 10 years and the door has opened for me to do more of that. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really excited about it, but it's, um, it's definitely bittersweet because I love the team here. I love Jonathan and Ruth. I love Jonathan, everyone. I just, I love working with them and I love the kids. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very, very strange kind of feeling, um, but yes, that is the news. This is, this is one of those moments, it's like, ah, oh, like we feel feels. Because Emma, you're amazing. We love you. We're going to obviously fully pray Emma out and commission to her into what she's going into. There's a few things to note here. One, Emma is not moving away. Yes. <laughs> she is deeply embedded to the life of this church and into this community, and we love you, Emma. So we're excited for that. Two, did you notice that she said for 10 years she's been dreaming about getting more into this? So we have to know that the Lord is doing what he's doing in, in moving people around. And uh, Emma, this is really exciting. When I talk to Emma about what she's doing um, with this emotional coaching, her eyes just like light up. I mean, she feels lit up um, working with our kids. And I'm just so amazed at the way that you just steward our kids and lead them so well. Emma, you're amazing at that. Um, but watching you talk about having these pastoral moments with the, with the kids that you're working with and the emotional coaching, and you just light up. So we know that God is setting this up for Emma, so God is also transitioning something for us as well in our staff team. And so we're just excited to see what God has in store for us, and we also feel that ache because we love you, okay? So when you see Emma, give her loads of love and express that you're like, I feel sad, but I feel excited. All right, we love you. All right. Everyone feeling good? Nice, nice, nice. I told you um, a few weeks ago that having moved back from North America, Alice and I are used to lots of North American cultural things. And when I would preach, can I have a water, someone, if it's at all possible? Thank you. That's so generous. Oh, there's like a choice coming towards me. Okay, so I've got some Celtic spring water, or I can have a bottle that's already used. Yeah. I love you, Ruth, but... Whoa! Whoopa! If I was a bit more symbolic, I'd be like, the Lord is saying something at this moment. As it is, I'm just very wet. More Lord, indeed. Okay, just going to let that do its thing for a bit. Phil, please don't panic about the microphone. I'm sure it's going to be fine. Um, where was I before I... North America, thank you. And um, I, I said a few weeks ago, the North American culture, um, the congregation are very vocal, very vocal. So I, I, I welcome, I welcome all feedback as we're going. Unless you're like, boo, get off. In which case, just keep it to yourself, all right? Um, good. We're going we're gonna to carry on talking about tent, table, temple. You guys are getting really good at it now. I think we're all, like, we've all slowly losing tabernacle up there. We're slowly let, letting go of that word. Like, we all know it should fit in there somewhere. But, um, so we're in the tent. Well, we're in the temple, actually. But we're in the tent. We're in the tent. And uh, last week, Jonathan started talking about prayer. We're going to carry on talking about prayer this week. Um, next week's going to be fasting, so you might want to write in. If you want us to carry on talking about prayer rather than get onto the fasting, then do write in. Um, we're going to carry on talking about prayer. Uh, that was a powerful moment this morning. Thank you, Wendy, for bringing that, um, that prayer and for guiding us. Um, gosh, yeah. There you are. Um, yeah, there are moments, aren't there, where it's like, how do we pray? And someone taking time to articulate well how we should pray is really helpful. Um, along those lines, we're going to look today at the Lord's Prayer, okay? We're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can head to Matthew 6, and we're going to be going through that. 
Now it stopped spraying at me. I'm very grateful for that water. Thank you so much. Um, I want to tell you a prayer story. The prayer story in my life goes like this. Um, I used to uh, fly a lot backwards and forwards in North America to the UK and um, doing ministry trips when I was part of a ministry school uh, in Toronto. And uh, I would fly a lot on planes. Hello, my friends. Love you. Um, that was my housemate living in Toronto before I got married. So that's Dave. Yeah, that mate. Um, I'd fly a lot, and I, um, I would have a very consistent prayer that I would pray. Every time I traveled, I'd be sitting in the airport lounge waiting to get on the plane. Just, I didn't like flying at all, but it happened like, quite regularly. Every few months, I was getting on a plane flying. And um, I would sit in the lounge, and I'd be thinking, what's going to happen on this flight? And I would pray this prayer. Oh, Lord, I pray that on this flight, I would sit next to a very beautiful, very single Christian woman. <laughs> I'd be sitting there in the airport lounge just looking around like, <laughs> maybe they're a Christian, maybe they'll sit next to me. I would pray this every time I got on a plane. Don't judge me. That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer. Did you hear my criteria? Beautiful Christian. I should have said on fire, shouldn't I? Yes, that's fine, you know. It was implied. Um, and usually I got sat next to a, like a, a larger smelly man. That's <laughs> normally what happened. And I, so... <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Um, then, one fine day, I was on a trip to um, Norway. In Norway, I reconnected with Alice Ruth Jackson, as she was at the time. And uh, we'd been acquaintances before, but we found ourselves serendipitously in Norway at the same time, and we found out that we were actually flying back to the UK at the same time. In fact, on the same flight. In fact, on one of those cheap ones where you can pick where you sit. Well, I'll tell you what. I was in the airport lounge, and actually I didn't think about it because I was busy buying her coffee and trying to, you know, thinking, well, she's quite nice, I'll buy her coffee and blah, blah, blah. But when I sat down on the plane, and we picked our seats and we sat together, it did go through my mind. <gasps> there is a prayer that I pray very regularly. Lord, have you heard? <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know Alice, I mean, she is just a most gorgeous human being. The Lord hath blessed me abundantly. Um, yeah, I took her number at the end of that flight, and uh, guess where our first date was? In that balcony. Oh, isn't that nice? We went for dinner in Bath, and then we came to see Jesus Culture together. So was it a date, or were we just worshipping together? She didn't know, but I knew. <laughs> we raised hands before the Lord. Did my hands accidentally graze hers? <laughs> I don't know. The Lord knows. <laughs> Consistency as we pray is a very interesting thing. Well, Jesus tells us to pray a prayer with great consistency. We find it in Matthew 6. Um, the Lord's Prayer is an extraordinary prayer. And I want you to think about it this way, that Jesus gives it as a gift to his disciples. This, this prayer is truly a gift. When we read it, what you'll notice is, 
It's not like the disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he says, well, guys, this is what you've got to do. First off, you've got to really remember to, to keep these theological things in their context. Uh, what you need to do is come with this kind of half attitude and you need to blah, 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 blah. He doesn't come and give them that kind of instruction, does he? Instead, he gives them a poem. A poem. And we don't need to be worried about that or feel like it's, uh, it diminishes its power. No, this is like, this is God's word spoken to us. But he gives it to his disciples in poem form. Why? Because he wants them to remember it. He wants it to be this piece, this set piece that they can remember, that they can recall to mind, that will stick with them so that they can start to have it embedded in their lives. The Lord's Prayer is really the DNA of the prayer life of Jesus. We're told that Jesus would go frequently into the quiet places, into the still places, the desert places to pray. And he would meet with his Father in those places. And so when the disciples say, Jesus, teach us how to pray, we can only assume that the prayer that he gives them as a gift is a real reflection, is, is a DNA model of what he was doing with his father. So this is a really exciting thing, and I want us to think of it this morning. This is a gift. It's not just a few lines of theology. It's a gift to us. And any engagement that we have in it, if you've been using it as a prayer for your life, you'll understand why it's been so enduring for 2,000 years within the life of the church. Why are we hanging on to it? It includes a guide on how we are to posture ourselves before God and how we're to ask for, self, ask for stuff for ourselves. It includes numerous prayer styles of praise or adoration, of supplication, petition, that's just asking for things, of a declaration of faith, of confession and repentance, and of spiritual warfare. Now, one thing I want to note about it being a poem is that Jesus gave it this way so that it would defamiliarize itself. It would become like a new thing that kind of stuck in their minds. But over time, how many of you have heard the Lord's Prayer being prayed in church? Maybe 10 times. Come on, throw your hands up if you've heard it 10 times. Keep them up if you think you've heard it 100 times. How many, how many of you think you've probably heard it 500 times? All the same hands are still up a thousand times. The hands still go up. And so this thing that Jesus gives us as this poetic form meant to make the imagination and the minds of the disciples go, oh, interesting. I wonder why he phrases it like this. I wonder what we're meant to do with this line of the poem. It's now become very, very familiar to us. In fact, if you go to any non-Christian and you say, do you know any prayers? They'll probably say, oh, I, I don't know. Or maybe they'll say, well, I learned the Lord's Prayer when I was in school. Now it's become something which has become entrenched into our faith tradition and even into our culture. But my prayer is this, is that, um, Jesus, just as we open this text, would you somehow defamiliarize it to our ears and to our eyes and to our understanding? Because we want to see afresh. We want to see afresh. So let's dive into it. Matthew 6. I'm going to start actually at verse 5, just before the prayer. Jesus says this, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they know they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
Can we go back to verse um, 9, please, David? And I would want us um, just to pray this together. This, then, is how you should pray. Let's do it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgotten our debtors. And lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Thank you so much. Um, uh, probably uh, a good chunk of you are squirming because you're like, you didn't finish it. Well, it's not in the NIV, actually. But if you go through, you'll find that last line, uh, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. It's in the King James Version. It's not in early Greek manuscripts. It is in later Greek manuscripts. So that's the whole interesting thing. Go and look that up if that interests you. But let's skim back. Verse 5. This is not a show. Jesus says when you pray, it's not a show. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. He says then, but when you go, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what's done a secret will reward you. The message says it like this. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. <laughs> One more time. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you'll begin to sense his grace. Michelle did an amazing job uh, a few weeks ago talking about how we can find uh, God in a personal way, how we get into that place of being in his presence and encountering him. If you didn't hear it, I really recommend going back and checking it out. I want us to be mindful of that as we get into here, that there is an invitation into authenticity as we pray. Jesus carries on. He says, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you even ask him. If you feel weak today at praying, if you feel imperfect in your language, take courage because the Lord is not after great linguists. He's after children who will be honest. So as we go and we look at this poem now, now we get to verse 9. Now we get these six phrases, beautiful six phrases. And if you're looking at your scripture, you'll see that they're divided into two halves. We've got the first half, which says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The first half of the Lord's Prayer is clearly shown by Jesus that we are meant to get our eyes on the Father. That's our first model for praying. First off, we get our eyes up and on the Father. Then he pivots. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation. The first thing Jesus does is invite us to lift our eyes, speak to the Father, your kingdom come. We're called first to focus on his name, his kingdom, and his will. So, Jesus says, this then is how you pray. And I want to I wanna just pause and take note that when Jesus says, this then is how you should pray, what do you think we're meant to do with that phrase? When he says, this then is how you should pray, what do we do with that? Do we treat that as a, huh, well, maybe I'll get that out of the box once a year, give it a dust off and uh, give it a whirl? Or do you think it's meant to be entrenched in our lives? This, 
this poem is not like the sum total of our prayer life, but it is meant to be frequent. It's meant to be a blueprint of how we can come before God in prayer. If I ask you, what are the key prayers that humans all pray, what would you say? What's like the, what are the most gut reaction prayers that we pray? If we think about reactive prayers. Help. Yes, good. Didn't take long to come out, did it? This morning, the power wasn't on. What's the prayer? Help. Quite simply, help. What else are reactive prayers? Yeah, heal me. Save me. Yeah. Say again. Protect me. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are about our immediate needs, right? Oh gosh, I have a need. And maybe on the flip side, a gut reaction prayer that we have as well is when something amazing happens, we say, oh, thank God. I mean, really, that's a prayer, isn't it? That's a prayer. Thank you. For, for, the, for the believers, it shouldn't just be casually using the name of God, but it, it's saying, no, God, thank you. Thank you. But here, Jesus is saying, my disciples, you who are following me, I don't want you to just pray reactively. I want you to pray proactively. And this is how I'm inviting you to pray. Now, many of us have come from church traditions where we would pray this prayer every week. And I'm aware we don't do it here, but, but my, I suppose my first encouragement is Jesus has given this as a prayer for us to pray. Not just to have as something cerebral that we keep as like a, well, that's kind of could be a tool on my tool belt. No, this is, this is something we're invited to keep as something uh, close to our hearts. I have a prayer as a charismatic who um, also loves the contemplative tradition um, that God, I don't want to be a proud charismatic. In the life that I live, following the movement of your spirit, May I not lose the richness and the depth of the deep wells that have been found in churches that I feel are more formal than mine. That's my prayer. I pray it for us as a body. This prayer is for us to pray. And he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He kicks off with this extraordinary language of Father. Everyone say Father. When you approach God... How do you pray? And what language do you give to the Lord? It's really interesting if we dig into it that some of us immediately say Father. Some of us say Lord. Some of us say Jesus. Some of us say Holy Spirit. It's interesting the way we pray. It is actually indicative of uh, where our theology is at. Who we perceive God to be. And Jesus is coming into first century Palestine, and there has been language in, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Judaic tradition of calling God Father, but it's, let's be honest, it's a bit few and far between. We're much more likely in the Old Testament to find references of Yahweh as being Lord, yeah? The Lord, the Almighty, that's the way that he is portrayed most frequently in the Old Testament. Now switch to the New Testament and see what happens. In Jesus, we get this invitation to call him Father. Father. It's not unprecedented, but it is unusual that Jesus most of the time references Yahweh as Father. He invites us to call Yahweh Father. Now if Jesus has come to reveal who God is, to reveal the nature of God, and he calls him Father, we need to pay attention. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If we look a bit further in the next chapter of uh, Matthew, Jesus says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? In Luke's gospel, he actually puts that passage right on the back of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus is, is really reinforcing this image. He's calling on the gut instincts of parents to look at their children. Now, how many of you have kids here? 
wave your hands. And uh, how many of you, when your kids come to you and they're like, I've got a need. How many of you want to be like, oh gosh, I don't want to hear from you. No. I mean, maybe there's going to be a little bit of a, oh, I wonder what it's going to be this time. Or maybe more accurately, I wonder how expensive it's going to be this time. But I've got young kids, so their needs are very simple. They don't, um, they're not asking for lots of big expensive things. But when they have a need, it is my good pleasure to give it to them. When they ask for shreddies in the morning, it's my pleasure not to give them stones. Right? I know how to give them good things. Sometimes I even give them jam on toast. That's right. I know how to give good things, but if I know how to give, give good things, how much more does your heavenly Father? Jesus is inviting us into this understanding that Yahweh, the one that his disciples have been praying to their whole lives, is their heavenly Father. Jesus is hammering home this point. So another challenge for us this morning, that if it feels uncomfortable to call God Father, we've got some work to do. And there's some really good reasons why we might not feel comfortable calling him Father. Our own earthly fathers will so shape the way that we view that concept of a parent that it will automatically be superimposed on a way that we view God. And so if we do have problems with our earthly parents, it's something we really have to wrestle through because Jesus' invitation is this, come and call him Father. And then we switch gears. And he says, hallowed be your name. May your name be holy. That's literally all it's saying. May your name be holy. And here, Jesus is giving us this invitation to reset our daily understanding of how we see the holiness of God. Now, I want us to remember, Jesus gives this gift to his disciples. It's a gift. He gives it in poetic form. Again, why? Because he wants them to recite it again and again, to be thinking about it, to be forming them. This is an exercise in spiritual formation as they're praying this prayer. This is like, what this is going to be forming them. And he's asking them to have this rhythm, regular rhythm of saying, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. It's the restoration of God's name. Because names mean something. They carry an understanding and expectation this is a ridiculous example, but bear with me. I could buy cheap underwear, but if I buy my underwear from M&S, it means something. <laughs> it means I will pay a couple of quid more, but I'm serious about the longevity and the comfort and the lack of bobbling and pilling in the wash. Right? Names mean something. They associate an idea with us. And Jesus, is, now, now this is where my illustration is ridiculous because now we're talking about God. But Jesus is saying the name of God is to be kept holy. And he says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we're switching gears into intercession. It's a beautiful uh, prayer of intercession and it's a declaration. We're acknowledging the reality of heaven invading earth. Now, when God makes man, where are they all dwelling? Not a trick question. In a garden. Yeah, the Garden of Eden is described in Genesis. It's a beautiful story where God is walking with man in the cool of the day. God has created earth. There is heaven. And it's like the two are superimposed on top of each other. If you can imagine two circles superimposed on each other. And then we have the fall, man sins, and we are moved out of God's presence because of that rebellion. Now, in Greek thinking, which we still adhere to quite a lot, there's this idea that earth is down here, heaven is up here. Earth is down here, heaven is up here. Earth bad, heaven good, 
flesh, dirty. Spirit, like we get these images being conjured up in our minds. That's Greek thinking. It's not biblical thinking. Because God makes man out of the dust and he calls it very good. Mm. God's not really bothered by our flesh. In fact, he quite likes what he's made. And so in Jesus, we, are, we get a much more clear understanding of heaven and earth. Well, they're like, in Jesus, we have the overlapping presence of God, the kingdom come. Is there still sin in the world? Yes. Is there still something that feels divided from God? Well, yes. But there's this overlap happening where heaven is invading earth. Bill Johnson wrote that book, When Heaven Invades Earth. That is what Jesus is coming to pronounce, that the kingdom of God is present. It's here. It's at hand. So if it's here and it's at hand, and yet Jesus is praying, your kingdom come, we have a little wrestling to do. Has the kingdom of God come, church? About 10 of you are confident in that answer. I'll ask again, has the kingdom of God come? Yes. Yes. Has the kingdom of God come in its fullness? Okay. Has the kingdom of God come in this community, in this spiritual community of life, church? Has God moved and acted in your life? Yes. Have you seen the fullness of the kingdom manifested in your life? Or have we seen the fullness of the kingdom of God manifested in our community? No. Um, currently, Alice and I are, uh, and the kids are living with um, Paul and Jenny. Give us a wave, Paul. There he is. You lovely man. I love chatting with Paul. Paul um, is tenacious, and I love talking with him because he is daily. It's literally daily on his, li- on his lips where he says, if the kingdom is X, Y, Z, therefore, we should have X, Y, Z. And there's this contending go- going on, right, Paul? And we're not going to settle till we see it. Come on. Jesus' command for us to pray is to, be, to acknowledge the reality that heaven is invading earth. So the question is, what does it look like for the kingdom of God to be in your life? What does it look like for the kingdom of God to invade your workplace? What does the kingdom look like for your neighbors who live next door to you? What does the kingdom of God look like for this city of Bath. And this concept is so important that Jesus is inviting us, pray this, pray this daily. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we've been focusing ourselves, your, 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 your name, your will, your kingdom, The focus has really been on lifting our eyes. And so when Jesus is saying, this then is how you should pray, there's a clear instruction there. First off, just look. Look to him first. So that's our first invitation. And then we shift gears. The second half of the prayer is, how should we pray for ourselves? And Jesus asks us to pray for bread, for forgiveness, and for Deliverance. Those are the three things he's encouraging us to pray for. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. This is us asking. This is, um, I'm careful how I say this, but um, there's this beautiful concept in our worship life. And you know how the church like moves through different ideas and different um like gut, not gut feelings, but like different, um, I don't know. You'll understand when I say this. I feel like I hear this a lot at the moment. God, we want to seek your face and not just your hands. Yeah? We want to bless you for who you are, not what we can get out of it. Yeah? There's a real move of that. Um, And I think it is altogether beautiful and wonderful. So hear me on that. At the same time, 
there is a temptation if we just think like that, that we just move into, let's completely just put our attention on God and ignore whatever is going on in ourselves. Now, my challenge would be, is that entirely healthy if Jesus is asking us to pray for ourselves as well? So I just want us to think about that. Um, This relationship that we have is actually designed to be one of complete dependence. Complete dependence. When Jesus says, give us today our daily bread, he's talking to Jews who have a rich historical tradition of like telling, retelling the stories of their fathers, their forefathers, you know, their, their ancestors. So when he says to them, give us today our daily bread, immediately what comes into their minds? Who said it? Say it again. Manna. Manna. For those of you that don't know what I'm saying, ironically, that's what it means. <laughs> what? What? Manna means What? And the story goes that when Yahweh rescues his people out of bondage and slavery in Egypt, like he promised to do all those years ago to Abraham, he takes his people out of a place of danger, he redeems them, pulls them out of slavery by a remarkable series of events, and he's going to insert them into the promised land. But before he does, they wander around the desert learning to give their full trust and submission to him. And as they're walking around, they say, God, if we're going to wander around in this desert, we will need something to eat. And God says, I'll give you something to eat. And they wake up in the morning, and there's like a fine kind of grain powder stuff covering the ground. And their reaction is, what? And that's what the food is called, manna, which in Hebrew means, what? So when we read the words of Jesus where he says, give us today our daily bread, immediately in the minds of his disciples comes this thought, oh, I need to adopt the attitude of the Israelites in the wilderness, those who have been rescued and redeemed out of darkness The kingdom has come. And who are yet not quite living in the reality of the place that is promised. The kingdom which is yet to come. And in this tension, this in-between place, who loves living in tension? No one. (laughs) But things grow under tension. In this place of this in-between, Jesus says, pray this. Lord, would you give me today my daily bread? Now, the interesting thing about manna was they weren't allowed to keep it for more than one day other than when they were collecting it for their Sabbath. They had to collect it that day, cook it, and eat it that day. And they couldn't store it up for the next day because it would get worms in it. Why? Because Yahweh wanted to give his people this revelation, I will be all you need. I will sustain you. Now, we get altogether too comfortable, don't we? Our lives can be very easy to live by ourselves. I doubt, I doubt anyone in this room is worrying if they will get a meal today. But this is the invitation. Give us our daily bread. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Church, peace is not given from the willful ignorance or spiritual discipline of ignoring challenge. It comes when we give our challenge into the hands of a loving Father. Lord, you are what we need. And we, God, we, we invite you to challenge us to ask for the daily bread. Give us our daily bread. And do you notice the words Jesus uses? He, he was very capable of saying, give me my daily bread. 
but he says, give us. So in this second half, as we turn our attention from Yahweh to focusing on our needs, Jesus is also encouraging us. This isn't just you praying for yourself. This is you praying for your community. You guys doing okay? We're nearly there. Okay, so verse 12. This is our confession moment. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The second thing Jesus invites us to ask for ourselves is forgiveness. Forgiveness is fundamental. He carries on in uh, verses 14 and 15 after the prayer. He says, For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Eep. That's a, that's a difficult one. Forgiveness is fundamental in the kingdom of God. We prayed for the ending of war today. Um, gosh, don't we need God? The spiral of hate does not stop. It just doesn't. Jesus references where he said, like, eye for an eye. That's in the Old Testament, in under the Old Covenant. The tit-for-tat mentality of, well, if you did this, I'm going to do this. Because I did this, you're probably going to do that. And because you do that, I'm going to do this. This like it's, it's a never-ending spiral. And when we think about the conflicts that are going on today, um, you just think about the children who are, you know, forget politics. Like, just think of the children who are seeing their parents or loved ones killed how they grow up, what choices do they make in their heart? If they have the grace to know how to forgive, they can move through. And if they don't, they'll be caught. But Jesus tells us that in the kingdom, that pattern gets broken. In those in the kingdom forgive those who wrong them. It breaks the pattern of hate. Yeah, I'm sure you've all heard stories of... Uh, people who end up in the courthouse of those that are being tried who have killed one of their loved ones. And it's fascinating to watch the reactions because I've heard two sides come out strongly. I mean, often you just see crying, you don't hear much from the family, but occasionally you get a statement that gets put on the news from the family. And there's, there's two things that, sh that shock. One that says... I will never forgive this person. I hope they rot for the rest of their life. The other is starkly different. And they say, I forgive. I choose to forgive. The thing about forgiveness is that it's not the pardoning of injustice. It's not us saying, no, justice doesn't need to be served. Justice needs to be served. If someone kills someone, they need to go to prison for it. But it's choosing to release the right for, comp for, for that compensation, the revenge. It's choosing to release the right for retaliation. And that's what Jesus calls us to. It's not the blind extension of trust either. It's not saying when someone abuses you, you say, oh, I forgive you, and I will put myself willingly back into your hands again. No. Thankfully. <laughs> That's not what we're told to do. In following Jesus, we are forgiving. And it's a tricky one. But we're called to forgive. We're called to forgive. Okay, last bit. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus himself was tested, right? We've got two places in Scripture where Jesus is tested. Where's the first one? In the wilderness, yeah. Jesus is baptized. The heavens open. The Spirit descends on him like a dove. And a voice comes from heaven and says, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus in that moment is like, whoa. Okay. And from there, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. The second place of Jesus' testing is where? 
In the garden. Yeah, it's in the garden. Well, do you remember he prays that prayer and he says, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Does Jesus want to go and suffer the agonies of carrying the weight of sin? Does he want to? Is his flesh excited by the idea? No. Yet not my will, your will be done. So it's interesting, Jesus is tempted, first off in the wilderness, he's tested on his identity. Who are you if you're the son of God? And he's tested on his submission to who God is. Because the devil gives him this choice. If you do this, I will give you. It wasn't his to give anyway, but different story. Then in the garden, Jesus is praying and he says, not my will, but your will be done. In the wrestle, in the fight, he again is having to practice submission. So Jesus, um, Jesus is saying uh, something really interesting for us to pray here. It's not just like, um, oh God, I pray that I wouldn't be tempted by that Belgian bun in Greg's, which I love so sincerely. I do love Belgian buns from Greg's. Whew. That's not the temptation. That's not the temptation that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about these identity challenging temptations, yeah? And what's his prayer? Lead us not into temptation. Hey, this is brilliant. Jesus says, pray to your father, hey, please don't tempt me. We get an invitation from Jesus to say, I actually don't want to go through that. I'm going to let that one just pause and sit with you. But, how many of you feel like you have been through a season or two in your life? I've had that moment. Yeah, a few furtive hands are going up. The second part to it is this. Lead us not into temptation, but, and you could almost add into this, but if I'm going through it, then deliver me. Deliver me, because Jesus knows the Father is good to deliver. And so here we have it, this gift that Jesus gives us in poetic form. He says to his disciples, when you pray, remember this. And he gives them this language which shakes up their thinking so that they can remember it, they can dwell on it, and they can rehearse it again and again and again. And the invitation is there for us. When you pray, Life Church Bath, do it like this. Focus on your Heavenly Father. Lift your eyes up. Pray for the kingdom to be revealed. And when you've done those things, start to pray for us. Not just me, us, for forgiveness to be a hallmark of who we are, for that daily asking of provision, for us to be a people who are dependent on the Father, and for us to be people that say, Lord, would you cover and protect us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's a lot in here, isn't there? There's a lot in this prayer. So I'm going to invite us just to stand, and we're going to pray this prayer again together. David, can we get that back up on the screen? Starting from verse 9, thank you. So church, we're going to do this quite slowly, okay? So don't feel like you have to rush on. We're going to do one slide at a time, nice and slowly. So take your normal reading speed. And relax it. All right? Deal? Here we go. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's just pause. And just in this pause, let your prayers be added to this. Next line. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pause. Next verse. Give us today our daily bread. One more time. Give us today our daily bread. Next verse. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Next verse. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All right, church, I'm going to invite us just, if you want to have your eyes closed, open whatever you're most comfortable with, we're just going to spend another couple of minutes praying here. I want to encourage us, whatever the Holy Spirit highlighted to you, whatever feels like it's the most pressing thing at the moment, maybe you read through that and you thought, actually, there's someone I need to forgive right now. Maybe it feels like the manifesting of the, pre- the kingdom of God feels like it's a million miles away from your situation. You want to pray into that. Um, may, maybe it's about um, the holiness of God and his name and how the Lord wants to speak to you about that. Can we just all just start lifting up our prayers And just um, praying out to him. Whatever he's putting on your heart, let's just start to lift it up and pray before him. Don't be shy. Let's all pray at once. Let's just go for it. Let's lift up our prayers. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the grace to live in right relationship with you and with others. Thank you for this prayer, which is the manifestation of the great commandment, to love you with all of our heart and love others as we love ourselves. God, help us to live this. Help us to live this. Um, Church family, we love you so much. Um, If you would like some individual prayer ministry this morning, if you need us to stand with you, for healing or uh, just for the spirit to be with you for something you're going through, please do come up to the front and our prayer ministry team will be really glad to pray with you. Otherwise, have a beautiful week and let's pray this prayer. Maybe it's a challenge, let's pray this prayer daily this week uh, and just lean into him. God bless you, church.